Okay, well you can see I am Pat Wheeler and I was born and reared in Fairfield and graduated from Fairfield High School. My classmate Janie Davison Bannister is back here and um, we come back every year to Fairfield. Love, this is always home for me. And um, I was saying earlier, the reason um, this seminar came about was um, we give a scholarship in memory of my mother, Jean Toma, who was a guidance counselor at the high school for um, many years. And so in reviewing the applications that come in for that, I was a little bit appalled that they aren't, weren't better um, constructed. So I said something to Barb and she said, well, why don't you present a seminar? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, but not just applications for um, the Greater Jefferson County Scholarships next year, but I want to give you some things that um, to, to contemplate as you're thinking about college and where you want to go and what you want to do. And when you get there applying for other scholarships and financial aid that those institutions have available. So if you have questions as we go along, just stop me and ask. There's, there's no dumb question, and I want you to, you know, get as much information as you can out of the presentation. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is image. And I used a, a professional image, but I'm really talking about the image of your paperwork. When you apply for a scholarship through, through the school or through the, the Jefferson County Foundation, a lot of those people on the adjudicating committee know you. They've, they've watched you grow up in Fairfield, they know you and they know a little bit about you. But if you're applying for scholarships through the universities or colleges or privately funded scholarships, they don't know you. And so your paperwork tells them immediately they have a judgment just by looking at your paperwork. So I think most of you would probably agree that the, the lady on the right looks a bit more professional than the girl on the left. Whether she is or not, we don't know that, but she, she appears to look that way. And the same thing is, tr is true with your paperwork. So when you see this and you see stuff all scratched in on the right by hand, and you see it all printed very nicely on the left. Then it says to the reader, this student took the time and cares about applying for this scholarship. This student just scratched in anything they wanted to. And um, I believe Barbara last year made a template and so uh, for the Jefferson County um, Scholarship. So you can go on and get the template now and just fill in the information, um, which makes it a lot easier. And the, uh, the uh, scholarship asks for activities and awards that you've had. And again, you can see how to put these in, in a very um, neat way so that the reader can fully understand the years that you participated, the offices that you held, et cetera. Because you're going to get points for each of these students on this scholarship. And, and typically, the people with the most points are going to be considered the finalists. Then there's questions on the scholarship application. And again, you need to put some thought into these questions and not just slap down anything that comes to you. What college or trade school do you plan to attend and why did you choose this institution? Now, I would hope that all of you will think about choosing an institution that will give you the best return on your investment. So if you were going to be a veterinarian, would you choose to go to the University of Iowa Probably not, because they don't offer veterinary medicine. If you're going to be um, a teacher, probably the best school in, in the state of Iowa that really focuses on teaching is the University of Northern Iowa. 
So look at that, students, and, and make an educated decision. Don't just think, oh, I'm going to, you know, wherever because my next door neighbor did. So these are some sample um, responses that I got. I chose to attend the school because it has a small school feel, like Fairfield High School, a lot of opportunities, close to Fairfield to visit, but far enough away to explore new things. Okay, but would you base your college on this? Would you solely base your decision on this? I, I would hope not, okay. Because I wanted to attend a college in Iowa, We've got lots and lots of colleges in Iowa. So that one doesn't ring very well. Because it fit my personality. <laughs> I hope not, that that's the reason. The college is comfortable and it's a homey feel. And I hope you do feel comfortable in the campus. But again, that's not a good reason, kids, for choosing a university. The campus is beautiful and the people are friendly. So here, this is a little long, but this is an example of a good answer. This person wants to be in pre-vet medicine. So their goal, right away they say, my goal is to become a veterinarian. And Iowa State offers that program. And then they talk a little bit about the national reputation of Iowa State. Then they talk about the student body. Why would they be happy with the student body? It's a diverse student body. They have people from all over. And it is ranked for its beauty, okay? The vision of the university is to create, share, and apply knowledge to make Iowa and the world a better place. I want to be a part of that. That's a great mission statement. And it is right here in my home state, so I know that I can pay in-state tuition. I know that I can get back to Fairfield, and I know yet I can still study with people from throughout the world because they have such a diverse student body. So do you see the difference now when you get that question? I want you to put some real thought into it as to why you're picking the school that you, that you want to pick. And this is the rest of your life. So, so you want to really make um, the best decision. And I, I'll tell you also, don't assume that colleges outside of the state will automatically cost you more money. Weber State University, for example, where I work, you could go to Weber State University and pay out-of-state tuition and go to school cheaper than you can at the University of Iowa. So do your homework and check with those people and see what your um, financial packets will be. What degree do you hope to earn and what career do you hope to pursue with your degree? Um, I think most of you are probably going to school to have a career. Aren't you? Isn't that kind of your anticipation? And so what do you want to do with it? So here's the point to stop and think about where your career is going to lay in your value system. Now, we, we all have a value system. There are about five values. And how you rank these values is a personal decision. So let's talk about those. One is a career. One is money. One is faith. One is your family and one is your personal agenda. And personal agenda is um, you have some students that if they can't ski from November to March every year, they would just curl up in a ball and die. Or they have to be able to, you know, do whatever sport they like. Your family, um, if, if that's your number one value, then you need to be choosing a career that is compatible with you having being with your family a lot. So if, if you wanted to be in sales, for example, and you have to travel, that's not real compatible with a, a family being a number one value. If money's your number one value, you don't care what you do or where you do it as long as you make the most money. 
if your career is your number one value, then you need to look at the career, the area that's going to let you achieve what you want to do in your, in your um, career. And I put this sheet in your uh, folder, Barb ran it off, because these are the latest statistics from the National Association of Colleges and Employers. And I put the national averages and the Midwest averages. And um, I feel kind of bad sometimes doing this because if money's your number one value, you can't always do on here your number one choice. And so sometimes your number one choice needs to be your avocation. For example, arts and humanities is still the lowest paid area. And so if you need to be the breadwinner and you want, it's important for you to earn a lot of money. Um, engineering, the hard sciences, physical science, computer science, those are the areas that pay the most. So think about that when you're looking at your major because what happens is on average um, students change majors five times and every time you do that then it's more time in school because then you don't have the right prereqs and then you know you're just spinning your wheels so I encourage you to look at that <clears throat> up front I'm undecided on my career plans at this point I wouldn't do that on a scholarship application. I would put something down. I'm not positive, but right now I'm leaning toward such and such an area. I loved this one. When I was little, I loved cooking with my grandparents and every holiday um, was special because I love making new recipes. I can't wait to continue on to bigger and greater kitchens. I plan to get my AA and then transfer to a four-year university. I really don't care that you like cooking cookies. Okay, so um, not a good answer. Okay, I hope to earn a BA degree. I hope to pursue some sort of degree in engineering, but haven't made any final decisions. When I saw this, I thought, hmm, very rarely do you get a BA in engineering, a Bachelor of Arts. Um, most engineering degrees are a Bachelor of Science. So, um, you could, but, but that tells me again that there's a little bit of um, um, BS in that, in that <laughs> answer. Okay, back to the student who applied. I hope to earn the degree of Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. I want to work for the federal government. I'm using my degree to study infectious diseases and drugs to eradicate disease in animal food sciences. Very short, very concise, very pointed. The, the student knows what he or she wants to do. Choosing your major or your school. Again, you've got to look at institutions that are known for the area where you want to major. And please make sure, students, that they have the accreditation that you want. So, pre-law, if you're thinking about pre-law, law schools will say right now, if you want to be in law school, do not major in political science and do not major in criminal justice. Now, lots of people think those are the two areas that you need to major in in law school but they like a diverse student body. So you need to think about maybe you're interested in patent law, maybe you wanna do engineering, or maybe human resource law. Um, but look at the schools again that have the reputations. And all of you should check the um, placement rate at the school where you're going. You find out what companies recruit there. You find out who hires those graduates. You find out what salary those graduates are going out in. Because if nobody's coming to buy the graduates from that school, you're going to be on your own when you get that four-year degree to find a job. And that's not what you're going to school for. You're going to get the return on, you know, on investment. So please, please ask them what their placement rate is and how, uh, what companies come. Then what you want to do for your career and then decide on the education that you will need. So too many people 
um, so I'm interested in this, I'm interested in that, and they start taking classes, and then they figure out what they want to do with it. Now, at my university, they have an integrated studies degree, a Bachelor of Integrated Studies, and it's actually three minors. And most of the students that end up in that major are kids that have a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this and they don't know what to do with it. So they put it together in this integrated studies degree, which could be, could be all right, but the employer says, okay, if I have a marketing grad over here applying for a job and I have a student over here who only has an emphasis in marketing, I'm going to take my marketing grad every time than the one that just has the emphasis. So I, I, I'm trying to save you money here. I'm trying to get you to think about this ahead of time so, so you can not spin your wheels. Are there internships available? Do they offer internships? If you want to do theater, I would find out. Do they have are there opportunities for you to go to New York or, or regional theater? Where, where can you do internships in theater? Because they mean everything to you. And, and we'll talk about internships again um, in a little bit. But all of you need to put that in your memory bank that before you get out of school, you need to do an internship because it will increase your salary offer about $1,500 when you get out of school. What access to professors do you have in the classroom? When we went to University of Iowa, we didn't have a full professor till we were a junior. Um, at a smaller institution like Central or um, Coe College or Cornell, um, you're probably going to have full professors right off the bat. If you are very disciplined and dedicated and you, you can function and do studies on your own, that's probably all right. But if you do better with that interaction with the professor, then I would certainly look at a smaller institution. Because don't automatically think the bigger institutions are better, bigger and better than the smaller ones. They're not. In fact, um, just north of Oskaloosa in Grinnell, it's called the Harvard of the Midwest, and it's a wonderful, wonderful four-year institution. Any well-known faculty teaching in your program? Again, if you do your research, um, when we went to school, we had Professor Van Allen teaching physics at Iowa, who was um, known throughout the world for his work in physics. And so if you were a physics major and had the opportunity to work with him, it was, it was just enhanced your credentials to no end. So think about um, or find out what faculty you're teaching there. How large is your program? What's the acceptance rate into your program? For most of you, you after you take your general education classes, then you will apply to get into your program. And you need to know um, what, what kind of GPA, what acceptance rate do they have. And what scholarships are offered to students majoring in your discipline. So check that out, students, with the financial aid off. You're going to check it out here locally. You're going to check it out with the financial aid office. And um, check it out with the department with the individual department at your school, what scholarships do they have, and then check it out online um, for any scholarships for um, high school students. And are there any famous alumni from this school? Because famous alumni help you get um, into other areas. Uh, Robert Dotson that graduated from my program was the founder of T-Mobile. And so he opened up a lot of opportunities for business students. Um, every school has well-known alumni, and most of them are very happy to reach down and help other graduates. OK, then look at the secondary information. How much is their tuition?
room, board, fees, you've got to figure that in. Um, even if you're living off campus, you're going to have to have, you're going to have rent. Student fees can be pretty high in some places. Distance from home, if you want to get back and forth, how much is that going to cost you? Size of the school and size of the program. Access to classes. Access to classes, what did I mean by that? Oh, the availability of classes. Can you get in the classes that you need? Um, or is it, and that keeps you from progressing at a, a proper rate as well. So are you able to get in, you know, pretty readily to those classes? Extracurricular programs. Some of you, um, I hope you don't do a lot of that your first couple years, but um, if you like to be involved, then you should look at what they have available. Okay. In what way will this scholarship enable you to pursue your education beyond FHS? Um, and put some thought into this, okay? Um, student loan debt is a huge concern. I want to go to a school that has opportunities, but I don't want to end up with a lot of debt, but I have to pay off and pay off. This scholarship would give me some financial support it helps me gain an education that somehow benefits this community. And that's not going to be a ding against you if you all don't want to come back to Fairfield. But, you know, it's nice that you want to give back to, to your community. So I don't, this scholarship will help me because it'll give me money to go to school because I have two other children in my family and my folks work and there's not enough money to go around. Those aren't thought provoking statements. So take some time and really um, think about that. Please provide any additional information that will help the committee um, evaluate you. Okay. I don't care. You know, <laughs> I should be considered because I've worked hard. Who hasn't worked hard? You know, it, I'm a hardworking individual. If you invest in my future, if you committee invest in my future, I promise you that I will not drop out and slack my way through school. I'm going to use this money, I'm going to get my degree, I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to secure the best future I can. See, the committee is just like any, any employer. Who, what student is going to give us the best return on our money? We're going to give you our money, or you our money, or you our money. Who's going to make the most of it? That's what impacts the decision on who's going to get the scholarship. Okay, now I want to talk to you a few minutes about your resume. <coughs> you should submit a resume along with your scholarship application. And nobody did that this past year, and we went over it last year. Because the application, you saw when you print up your activities, but it, it doesn't give you a good picture of, of you. And the minute you cross that stage next spring, students, as far as employers and colleges are concerned, you are no longer a high school graduate, you're a college freshman. And there's an expectation that college students know how to act and present themselves as professionals. So I'll go over this. I think you have a copy, uh, Barb put a copy in, but I'm gonna go over it for you so um, you kind of understand why it's created this way. <coughs> there are tons of ways to do a resume. The sample that I'm giving you was put together by the corporate HR recruiters that recruit our students and this is what they want to see and it works. So that's why I'm using this sample. The first thing is your contact information, okay? And please make sure that your email address it's not hotchick at lisco.com, okay? Make sure it's a, a decent email address and your telephone number and et cetera. Okay, your objective. Your objective is to obtain 
the Ralph A. Perry Memorial Scholarship to help offset expenses at Iowa State University. If you're applying for more than one scholarship, then I would do a resume for each scholarship application and put the name of that scholarship so that that committee has a resume specifically targeting the scholarship that they're giving. Your education. Now in this whole resume, you start with the most current information and you work backwards. So you will put Fairfield High School and you'll put June, May or June 2016 as your graduation date. Um, your, your graduation number out of your class and your counselor can tell you that. <coughs> Can't they? Sure, yeah. <coughs> yeah, or the office. Your GPA, any other certifications that you've gotten along the way. If you're certified in any truck driving or whatever, put, put your certifications on there. Your leadership. Again, you have it on that sheet that we looked at earlier, but you see how much easier it is for the committee to read it this way? And so, because you can't exactly tell everything you did, um, if you'll just list the experience and the years that you did it, then on an attachment, you can put leadership specifics. And then you could put, um, Editor, Troy Banner, <coughs> managed a staff of five reporters that met um, weekly deadlines for, published, for uh, paper published in the Fairfield Daily Ledger, um, interacted with um, uh, students, teachers, administrators, etc. Okay, and you can, you can um, define what you've done at each um, leadership responsibility. And that'll, let, that'll tell the committee even more what you've done than just listing it. Your work experience, start again with your most current and you wanna quantify students. So this, this individual taught 45 to 50 um, swimmers. If you are, are um, a service person in a restaurant you know you interact with with approximately 20 customers per hour you're responsible for um, a fine dining experience or quality control of the food or whatever you resolve any issues so be very specific in in your um, chores that you have your skills and you've got to have your software knowledge on your uh, resume. They all want to know that now. If you speak a foreign language, be sure that that's on there because that's a plus. Um, anything that you put in skills, those students, the reader has to be able to go back up and see where you did it. So if you tell the reader down here <coughs> that you're a leader, demonstrated leadership skills, then I, I get to go back up and find out where you, were, where you were a leader, who you led, and how many you led. So you can't tell me you're something down here if you can't back it up, up above. Do you see what I'm saying? And lots of people do that. And you'll go, I, I don't see where they led anybody to do anything. So make sure that you back up those skills. And then your community involvement, because that's part of your application as well. Um, some of you have had an opportunity to do more than others, but that will definitely give you some extra points if you've had some community involvement. And then you proof, proof, proof your resume and give it to your parents or give it to a friend to proof it again, because if you make a mistake in your resume, especially if you're applying for a job, that's it. It will go in file 13. So proof it and make sure that it's good. And once you get this format down, then once you go to college, you're just tweaking it a little bit depending on what's coming available or if you're applying for more scholarships once you're there. 
or honor societies, etc. Okay, this was current <coughs> as of last year, and I, um, it's still pretty much true. Um, employers have higher expectations for college graduates. There's an increased emphasis on GPA and um, leadership. They're looking for people that have leadership experience. So let's talk about your GPA a minute. You're excited to go to school. I was excited to go to school. And you just are kind of excited to take all these different op classes that are offered to you. But don't load up too heavy students that first semester. Because the, the grade point that you establish that first semester is going to carry you all the way through school. And you want to start high, as high as you can, because when you hit the hard classes, that gives you a little leeway in there to, to maybe not do quite as well. Um, right now, this year, to be a competitive candidate for these employers throughout the United States that are looking for, for good career jobs, they're looking at a 3.5 in your major. So grades are everything. And it used to be, you know, will you just give me this good old C student that works hard and puts him or herself through school and, and plugs away, but now they can get the A student that puts him or herself through school and plugs away. So your grades are everything. But so is leadership. And <coughs> please make sure that somewhere, when you can, while you're at school, you plug in some time to get some leadership experience. So these are the top six factors that the employers are going to use to evaluate you to see if you're a good candidate for employment. Now this is nationally, okay? The National Association of Colleges and Employers is made up of employers from all over the United States that's recruiting college graduates. And, the, and people like me who are at the college, sorry, that um, help these students. <clears throat> and, and the first one is, has had a leadership position. It doesn't have to be, you know, a, a student class president. It could be a president of a club. It could be a vice president of a club or just something to show that you, you have those skills. Your academic major. Now again, that, that goes back to what's hot and what's not. Um, you know we're in a technically advanced um, society and, and those majors are hotter than some of the others. So um, I'm not saying you can't get a job with those others, but it, it's going to be more difficult. High GPA, we talked about that, a 3.5 or better in your major and a minimum 3.3 three overall. Now that's the bottom, 3.3 three cumulative is the bottom. So the higher the better. Involvement in extracurricular activities goes along with your leadership position and the school you attended. Now remember when I said you check out their placement rate and you see who recruits from there and who goes there? So the school you attended, are you attending a school that is attractive to employers for, for the particular area in which you want to work? You've got to look at that, students. And volunteer work. So when you get a chance to do any volunteer work, even if it's in the summer, when you're back here in Fairfield, that, that will go a long way because volunteer work is just as valid as paid work experience. So even you may not be getting paid, but that doesn't mean it's any less significant to employers. Okay. <clears throat> now, after you get your scholarship, it's very important that you write a thank you note to the donor thanking them for considering you and for the, the money that they've given you. And Barb got a couple that were exceptional this year, and I want her to read those to you so it will give you an idea of what to say. To the Ralph Perry Memorial Scholarship Committee, 
Thank you for recognizing my talents and abilities and awarding me the Ralph Perry Memorial Scholarship. The money will certainly help to offset my cost of attending Luther College in the fall. However, knowing that a group of people who I may not have even met think I will do well in life is far more important than any scholarship I may receive. I will work hard to validate your expectations of me. Thank you so much. And then the second one says, I am writing to thank you for your generous $2,500 Jack Sellers Career Tech Scholarship. I was very happy that I was selected as one of the recipients. The financial assistance you provided will be a great help to me in paying my educational expenses. Thank you again for your generosity and support. Okay, I want to talk to you about a couple more areas that are important to employers so you can, you can think about those. One is your geographical mobility. Now, if, you, if you're looking at working for a global organization, then you probably might have to leave Fairfield to do that. So that's something you want to think about when you're looking at your major and you're looking at your career. If it's important for you to stay here, then, then that needs to factor into your decision. Your communication skills. That's probably the biggest area that employers criticize all students every year for their poor communication skills, written and verbal communication skills, because again, there's an expectation that college students speak and write like professionals. So we wasn't driving to Eldon last night, and him and me aren't going to the show, or me and her aren't going to the show. You've, you're a professional, and you've got to pay attention to that, students, and and speak accordingly. Um, internships, let's talk about internships a minute. If your school doesn't offer internships, then that's a red flag because every good school should offer internships. You will typically not be ready for those until after your junior year at the university because your first two years you're primarily taking general education classes that everybody takes. And then once you finish those gen ed classes, then you get into your major area. And that, so for the internship, you have to have enough knowledge to bring something to the table, even though it's a learning experience for the employer, that you still have to have enough knowledge to help them out with a project. One internship is good, two is great, three is even greater. So if you could do one, you know, one, two or three internships, that would just boost your marketability greatly. And as I said, typically it increases your salary offer about fifteen to twenty five hundred dollars when you graduate having that internship. If you can get it for credit, I would encourage you to take it for credit because it shows the employer that you in fact did actual accounting work or nursing work or um, worked with a, with a vet, et cetera, rather than doing a coffee and donut run every morning or running copies for the employer. And so that credit says, yes, they actually did the work. And your program should just ask about it. Do you have internships? Are they for credit? Um, do I have to get those myself, or do you help the students get those? What's the process for that? Do you have students that um, go outside of the state? Now, there are three great internships that, um, I don't know if you know people that have taken them, but your two senators and how many representatives do we have in Iowa? Do we? In, in Congress? They all have internships in Washington, D.C. And there's student housing there available. And those are terrific internships. Do you know why? It's not necessarily just for what you're doing for them. But look at the people that you meet. Look at the contacts you meet while you're on the Hill 
working with all of meeting all those people those are great great internships and Grassley has them and whoever else just got elected I'm not up on my Iowa politics who okay um, they they hire interns every semester so they'll hire them some for fall semester some for spring and some for summer and when you go back to DC you need to ask about the housing and then uh, if you're in a group with with students from other universities they plan things and have picnics and all kinds of fun things and then if you're if you're um, gosh look what that would be for you you're just right across the river from New York and oh, wonderful <laughs> <laughs> so you would just you know, um, who was that kid from Iowa that got that internship with David Letterman, wasn't it? A kid from Iowa? Well, he gets for him. So, I mean, don't, don't, I mean, hit, think big, think big and, and do that. So internships are very, very important. Um, networking, networking, begin your networking now. You talk to people in Fairfield that are doing what you want to do. Ask them how they got their career. Ask them how they ended up doing that. Are they happy with what they did? Would they have done something different if they were going back to school? Um, if you want pre-law, you should go talk to Tim Kiken or Craig Foss or just say, you know, did it all end up like you wanted it to? Or do you wish you would have majored in something else before law school? Do you wish you would have not gone then or gone early or whatever? So you have an idea because knowledge is power. And the more knowledge you have, the more informed decision you can make. I think that the people in Fairfield with whom you would network would be lifelong uh, mentors for you. I, they're so concerned and so helpful. I think you could come back to them in the future over and over again and say, listen, I have this offer, I have this offer. What do you think would be best for me to do? What would you, what would you take? Give me some advice here, help me. I, I can't think of anyone in the town that wouldn't be happy to mentor you and be a, a support system for you, I truly don't. So that's important, and your network just keeps growing and growing and growing. Now, I want to say something else. I, last, this year, chose um, my students that I would consider as recipients for our scholarship. And after I chose them, I went and looked at their Facebook pages. And I threw them all out and started again. I threw out all my top five, got rid of them, started again. Oh, students, your Facebook pages are so, so important. Please make sure those are a representation of you and what you want the public to see about you. Because I, I just went on there and I looked at them and said, nope, I don't think so. I don't want that person representing my scholarship. So you make sure that those are clean and everything you want on them, okay? Is it important to have social media if you don't already have it, like a Tumblr or a Facebook account? I mean, do you think that's... I think it will be when they get to the university. I think you should all have a LinkedIn page because so much recruiting happens through LinkedIn now. Um, and you can keep updating that. But I'm just telling you what goes on there is on there. And it may be fun as you're interacting with your peers here at Fairfield High, but okay, you're, you get what I'm saying, right? Okay. The question was, should you have uh, social media? Should you be participating in social media other than Facebook? Or, and I said LinkedIn, it would be a good one for, um, for college. And also now for your scholarships, you should be able to go into LinkedIn and perhaps find out um, FHS graduates and where they're working and what they're doing. So that again, you could contact them for 
advice for mentoring um, and just say, I found you, I'm, I'm a senior FHS, I found you on LinkedIn, I understand you're doing da da da, and um, I wanted to know if I could ask you some questions about your career and if you'd give me some advice. The, people like to talk about what they're doing, you know, and they like to share with you. And let me tell you, we've got a lot of FHS graduates that are all over the world working in terrific, terrific opportunities. If you have a Facebook page that maybe with your friends is not quite kosher, is there a way that you can clean that up now so that going forward? I don't know that. Um, the question is if you have a Facebook page that's questionable now, can you clean it up for the forward? I, does anybody know? I don't know. Well, you can hide things from your timeline. Like if friends have tagged you in things that maybe aren't quite so clean, you can hide them from your timeline. So if someone just like looks you up and takes a look at your page, it won't show up anymore. However, if someone like became friends with you and then looked at it, that might change. I'm not sure. I just don't know enough about it. And if you get hassled for it, or if you get kitted for it, just say, hey, hey, I'm thinking of life beyond high school, so that's just the way it is, you know? I'm not going to participate in that kind of activity on my Facebook page. All right, now I want to answer questions that you have. There's no dumb questions. What questions do you have about um, scholarships? And, and Barb can help answer those. And Um, work experience. If you've only worked on the farm, what do you suggest you put down? The type of work you did? Yep. I had, a, I had a young man two years ago that the question was, if you've only worked on the farm, what do you put down? And by the time we got through with what he'd done on the farm, he had done a lot of things. <laughs> so you're responsible for time management because you have to feed the animals at such and such time every day. I mean, that's um, your, do you have milk? Do you do milking or tell me, talk to me about your farm. Um, yeah, milk, how we have pigs, we have the cows. Um, but you're, she's at 4-H. We had to do the ground or plowing. Yeah, the field work and the animals, just for each pigs, but the baby calves, we buy calves and she feeds them milk and then the fat cattle and the weaning them and medicine and stuff. Crop production. Yep. Crop. You're responsible for preparing the ground and, and planting crops for X number of acres that yield, you know, X number of crops. You are, are responsible for the care of X number of swine and X number of beef cattle. You're, you have to be um, you have to be responsible for inventory control of their medicines, of their feed, of of everything you have to have to maintain them. Um, you have organizational skills in organizing all that, and I said time management skills. Um, you have to be dedicated, a dedicated worker to that. Um, uh, and when things go wrong, you have to network with the other farmers if mom and dad aren't around. Right. And I don't know if you coordinate the sale of the beef or in 4-H even, and you groom them for 4-H and showing. I have to tell you a story. <laughs> this is a bad story. My husband was in 4-H. Should I tell this story? I Absolutely. don't know. <laughs> my husband was in 4-H, and we were dating. He wasn't my husband then. We were dating in Iowa. And he brought steaks from home one weekend, and so we grilled them out on the grill. And I was sitting at the table eating, and I said, oh, my gosh. This is without a doubt the toughest meat I have ever put in my mouth. I said, this meat is horrible. And all of a sudden, John gets his long and his face goes down, you know, and I said, what? And he said, that was my 4-H cow. 
<laughs> I said, I'm sorry, but it was still tough. <laughs> So you think of, you write down with your mom every single thing you've done on the farm. Every single thing you've done. And, and you make that into those statements. And you will be, you have some of the best background that employers look for. Because it ain't easy. You know, it's not easy doing that kind of work. And they love you for your dedicated work ethic. They know that kids reared on a farm. You have to be, because that's your livelihood. So think about every single thing. Don't slough over it. Just write down every single thing that you do and how often you do it, and then quantify. Great question. There are four legislative districts in the state of Iowa. David Lobsack is the representative from this district. Okay, but don't you think the others would perhaps um, also consider a student, if they're a student at I in Iowa? But, the, but this um, district, Fairfield is, in the, Fairfield is in the second district. Okay. just four districts, not five. Oh, okay. Okay. Is Lobsack the, the other senator? He is. No, he is Chuck the, Grassley. He's the representative. Chuck Grassley and Joni Ernst are the two. Oh, Joni Ernst. She's the one that got, okay. Okay. All right, yeah. Does the uh, local or the Iowa Senate have internships just in Des Moines or not? Does, does the Iowa Senate, I think they, uh, Hanson, does Kurt Hanson, I'm not sure if they do. My husband was an intern with uh, Chuck Moggin back in his high school days. Okay. So yes, they do. And again, it would be networking within the state, you know. It just shows a committee that you've, you've gone above and beyond to try to, to do more. Yes? Uh, is there any specific scholarships for maybe um, continuing students for MBA programs? Maybe like a site? Um, site for scholarships for continuing MBA programs. Um, well, first of all, any any university that has an MBA program, you will still qualify through their financial aid office for scholarships. Because usually they just automatically, whatever uh, you need money, they uh, just, I guess, invest in you. Uh, I guess, and just uh, give you the rest in scholarship. And I guess in general, all universities do that, what you just said, okay. Most of them do. Um, this lady in the purple back here um, represents a scholarship for women that are continuing their education. And you may, this is Liz, my friend Liz, and you may want to talk to her. Um, because she's in an organization that offers a continuing education scholarship and there are lots and lots of scholarships available for women um, who are furthering their education so um, I would Google female scholarships and see what comes up graduate female graduate scholarships and see what comes up and that brings up a good point of what's in here. Did you go over any of this? No, I just said they were in there, Barb. Yep. So I tried to include every school, even that one up in Iowa City. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it takes it takes some work. Because you have to sit there and you have to look and you have to look and you have to look. So this is just, you know, starting Iowa State stuff here. This is just starting University of Iowa. This is, this is just throwing out there scholarships, and here's scholarships.com. And you can, sign, you can go online and sign up for scholarships.com, and then they'll, they'll shoot you emails and things of what's available and what's coming up. So it takes a little bit of work, but it's free money, more or less, if you work for it. And it can be very beneficial. Do not pay any money for scholarship help. You will get these these organizations that say if you give us five hundred dollars, we will find scholarships for you. No, 
you do not pay, they're, they're all published and you don't pay money. They're fly-by-night groups to get scholarship information. Deadlines don't do that. Deadlines, so if you're, you're all going to be seniors, right? So I, I would start applying in October of next year. Don't wait till spring because the money could be gone. So start getting it in there and be the first, be the top group so they have time to look at your um, application packet. And so students, have somebody look at that before you turn it in. Are your high school counselors, are they savvy to that? A oh, counselor? Yeah. We used to have two, but yeah. Well, couldn't they come to somebody on the committee that might help them look it over, yes. even though it's not a, a Jefferson County scholarship? They could. Like to proofread it? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm, Scott. I'm use him as a okay. Okay. I'm just, I, but you should have somebody look it over. It's another set of eyes to make sure that you're not missing anything, that you're presenting yourself in the best possible light that you can. So that you can get, you know, the lion's share of the money. And, and just keep going. Just keep applying and applying and applying. There are lots of them that are full ride scholarships that'll pay your entire way. So you you can have them just as well as anybody else. Are there questions? How many scholarships is too many scholarship applications? How many is too many scholarship applications? I, I, I don't think you have too many. I just put as many in as I felt that I qualified for. Until your arm falls off? Because um, there's so many that on those sheets that nobody applies for. Um, it, it does take time, but if you get a good packet, then you can pretty much copy that packet for each one except changing the objective on your resume and stating the name of the um, scholarship. I'm telling you, if you have a good packet like we went through, you're going to rise right up to the top because most students won't take the time to do it. They just scratch it down and send it in because their mother's been yelling at them and they just want to get them off their back. So if, if you if you do it, then it shouldn't, other than costing you the postage. My third daughter went, she was grounded seven months of her senior year. She was really a hard child. She Obviously. Applied for, <laughs> <laughs> she applied for 142 scholarships. She got her first two years at Iowa State, completely paid for. She went to Europe for eight months, her junior year, everything paid for. She's very good. She never talked to me her senior year, but <laughs> <laughs> every time she got on the ground, and she'd do something stupid, and yeah, she got good at school, right? Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so there is no amount. She should be able to read her sister's stuff. But well, that's what I was telling her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and just for you guys, my one of my sons went to Kirkwood. Mm -hmm. He did work study, and mm -hmm. he was in the financial office. He got a scholarship for 1500 He wrote a nice thank you. About three weeks into the quarter, they came to him, would you write another thank you? Because two scholarship, a scholarship was not done. He got another $4,000 by writing two more scholarships because the kids did not write them. So write a good thank you. I had, uh, last year, an empl I had, um, there was a boy from my school Weber State and a, and a graduate from BYU that were the final two competitors for a very lucrative position in Salt Lake City that paid 62000 a year right out of school. And these kids had competed, you know, three or four weeks in a row. And the Weber State student got it and the employer made a personal trip up to see me. And he said, I want to tell you that your student got it, and I want to tell you why. 
and it was because he wrote a thank you note. And that's the reason. It goes a long, long way, students. And any time anybody interacts with you in a business setting for more than 10 minutes, you should write a thank you note to them. We're all human beings, and that's the humanness that comes out of just taking the time. And I'm, I'm tickled not only to get the thank you note, but the students that um, we support, I like to follow you. I like to see what you're doing in school. I, I like to follow you through your freshman and sophomore year, and, and it's, just, it's just really nice for the donors to be able to do that. So you write a thank you for the interview? Is that what you're saying, if you get interviewed for a scholarship? Yes, thank you to the committee. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to meet with you all and visit with you. Um, I I'm, I'm feel very confident about my decisions uh, for my future education, and your help would mean a great deal to me financially, would enable me to achieve my goals, and I hope that you will give me every consideration. And following on, on that, <clears throat> we had a donor last year who was considering pulling her scholarship altogether. It was $1,000 because she had not received a thank you note from that year's recipient nor the year before. Of the six that she's given, she's received two. And that wow. was the first two years. She's a, a widow, no kids, you know, so she looks for these from from these high school students. And I talked her out of it and, you know, said, come on, you know, let's try it again. So I just hope and pray that this year her recipient sends her a nice thank you note, so. It just goes a long way. It really does go a long way. Any other questions? Where do you think you're gonna to go to school? Um, I think I wanna to go to school somewhere in the Chicago area because there's a new theater group um, uh, starting up called the Heartland Theater Company, and they used to work uh, with Way Off Broadway, which uh -huh. used to be here. So I know some of the people who are heading off that program, so I think that would be a good opportunity for me. Great, great. And you're still undecided. Yeah, I, I know I wanna look at Iowa State. And where do you think you're gonna go? Um, I don't think I'm going to go in-state, but um, I don't know. Do you, are you leaning toward any one particular? Well, since, so I'm 15 right now, and I'll be 16 when I graduate, and I'm not planning on taking a year off in between school, so I was wanting to go somewhere, like, in a state, like, near someone where I could live since I won't be a legal adult yet. And so I've looked at, like, California, like, UCLA, and because I have family in that area, mm -hmm. and on the East Coast, I have friends and family friends in, like, Pennsylvania, like that in Arizona also. So. Now Arizona State is a big party school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've also thought about U of A because that's my stepmom. Um, she earned her PhD in microbiology there, so she spent a lot of time at that school and she knows it really well. So I think that would be good too. If you're looking for a smaller school, um, out in California, Harvey Mudd's one of the finest four-year schools out there. Great reputation. So, well, um, do they have my contact information, Barb? It's on the resume, isn't it? Yeah. Is that my P. Wheeler uh, is email? P. Wheeler at Weber? Okay. So, if any of you have questions, of, uh, if you want to... Um, Write up a mock resume and email it to me in a Word document. I would be happy to critique that for you. And, and I'll make changes in red and email it back to you and say, well, what do you mean by this? Or I don't think this is too good. And, um, or I may say it's wonderful. But I'll be happy to do that for you. And you, you may continue to contact me if you want. I'll help you any way I can um, to get help from donors. Obviously your phone number is not valid on your track. Right. <laughs> 472. 9875. Oh. No. 
No, that's not right. Just but you can contact you by yeah, email. Yeah, email. Email. And and apply um, and, and the, the Jefferson County scholarships are available after the first of the year? Um, they're all at the counselor's office. I try to get them there, like, so they can work on them during Christmas break. Aha. Uh -huh. um, some of them may not be available, but, you know, just keep checking back. The deadlines on those are March 15th. Okay. So make sure you get them in in time. Most uh, applications need like uh, other adults to kind of have, like references. Some some have references uh, required, and um, yeah, so you know. Don't don't save that for last minute. Uh uh. Have uh, your references lined is up. Is that yeah. is that something that they could just you know like stockpile a stack from Mr. And Mrs. or from Mrs. Teacher and just. Do the same can they do the same reference for every scholarship well you can as long as the author doesn't identify the scholarship in that letter so in that case when we're providing references like here on the resume it just says furnished upon request will we put that or put the people's actual you would put furnished upon request but then you could add an additional sheet and just put references and put this, the people's contact information. Is that also a place where you could elaborate on your leadership positions and things you did in those, or that be on a separate sheet of paper as well? On, well, yeah, you probably won't have room on that to talk about it. So yes, you could do additional information on leadership. See, that way you're not forcing the reader to go to a two-page resume, because that's a kiss of death. But human beings, what they are, we're, we're nosy and, we'll, and we look at the second page and they'll read it. But you're not forcing them to read it. That's the difference. Um, but yeah, I think you could ask, but be sure you always ask a reference. Don't, don't put their name down without asking them. And then um, if you ask them to make the letter generic, say I will be applying for several scholarships, um, and would you mind being a reference for those? Would, would you mind writing a generic reference letter? Then they could just say, I'm happy to endorse so-and-so in her um, for scholarship applications, and this is what I know about her or him. Yeah, Janie. A deadline is a deadline. Yeah. That it is. We all wish sometimes there were maybe two more minutes on the clock for the football game, but when it's over, it's over, right? Well, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to visit with you. And again, I'm happy to serve, provide any help for you that I can. I just want you to be successful. You come from a great high school. You have great undergraduate education. And I don't want you to go to college and blow it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Yeah.